welcome. God's peace and blessings to you on this holy Sabbath. Thank you for welcoming us into your homes today as we gather to worship the God in whom we live and breathe and have our being. Thank you for the way that you pastors have supported your congregations and your communities. And thank you church members for how you have supported your pastors and each other during this difficult reality of living with COVID-19. We know that you would rather be gathered together in person in your various sanctuaries, but we are blessed that we can be gathered together in spirit for our worship today. We in your Synod office have put together this service using the gifts of our staff and various church members across our Synod to remind us that we are church together. In solidarity with all those who are not receiving communion today and in anticipation of the feast that is to come, we dwell on the words of Jesus, and that is enough. So we begin our worship today as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, Alleluia. Join us in the remembrance of our baptism. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with him to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image and planted us in a well-watered garden. In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the Good Shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross you gathered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for your salvation through water, for the water in this font, and for all water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and healing love. Satisfy the thirsty, and give us the life that only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. That the Lord has made. We will rejoice. We will rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. The Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and, be glad in it. and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another and to follow in the way of his commandments and to share his risen life with all the world. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Hi, I'm Sister Sarah Houskin, and I serve as our Synod's Youth Ministry Coordinator. Thank you for joining me for Children's Time. In our Bible story today, Jesus 
tells us that he is the way. He also tells us that he is going to prepare a place for us in his father's house, in God's house. And in God's house, there are many dwelling places. You know, isn't the whole world God's house? Jesus has prepared a dwelling place for you. He has prepared that place here and here and here. here. Jesus loves us and as his followers we get to love others like this. Here let me get that door for you. Do you want to play tag with us? This doesn't belong here. Good game. That was a nice catch. I'll clear the table. Wherever we go Jesus prepares a place for us. Let us pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for preparing places for us. Thank you for loving us so much. Help us to love others in your name. Amen. Bye. The reading is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 2 to 10. This reading speaks of Christ as the cornerstone of God's saving work and the foundation of our lives. We are people treasured by God who live out the mercy we experience in Jesus Christ. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to Christ, a living stone, though rejected by humans, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then who believe, he is precious, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of God who called you out of the darkness of night into the marvelous light of day. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Into your hands I place my life. 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 In you, O Lord, have I taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Incline your ear to me. Make haste to deliver me. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe, for you are my crag and my stronghold. For the sake of your name, lead me and guide me. Take me out of the net that they have secretly set for me, for you are my tower of strength. Into your hands I commend my spirit. 
For you have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Let your face shine upon your servants. Save me in your steadfast love. Into your hands I place my life. 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 Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to John, the 14th chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the, in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who's in the but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask for me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Alleluia. Jesus said, Do not be afraid. In my Father's house are many dwelling places, or mansions, or rooms. Right now, I have a new appreciation for that promise because for the past six weeks, this has been my room, a kid's bedroom transformed into my home office. But mine isn't the only Zoom room seen by others these days. Many of us spend hours a day connected to people in dozens of Zoom rooms. These are our many rooms today. Twice a day, our Synod staff gathers together from their rooms, and all of us are connected on one screen together. In addition, your pastors and deacons and leaders regularly Zoom in from their rooms, and suddenly one room literally becomes many rooms as we all Zoom in together. As you can see, these aren't mansions. And after six weeks, most of us would say there aren't enough rooms in any of our homes to keep us safe. But we are grateful to have these places. The wish we'd longed for so many times before, I wish I could just have a month to stay at home, has come true. And yet, we wish it weren't so. We're here because we are afraid. Afraid of COVID-19 and getting sick. Afraid for our parents and kids and frontline workers. 
afraid for our jobs and the economy, afraid of death. And so we stay in these rooms and then we realize we need to get out. And so we walk. Every day since stay at home began, I've taken a two mile walk from our house to the local quarry. Over a hundred years ago, people from Europe immigrated to this area seeking a better life and worked in the granite quarries. The granite shelf here runs over 150 feet deep. The stones run in rich veins of red and pink and charcoal gray. Stones were etched like this to indicate where the slabs would be cut. The massive stones like this that you see were actually rejected for use back then, but they stand here as a testimony to the faith of our ancestors who worked in these quarries and who worked to organize Lutheran congregations where people would gather to hear the gospel spoken in German or Swedish or Norwegian, where they'd sing and pray together, enjoy their favorite foods, treasure the community they shared and pass on their culture to their children. Many of these congregational church buildings still stand, of course. You know them well. But today those sanctuaries are empty. You know how we always said, go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be to God at the end of worship? And each and every person would go out those doors to be the body of Christ in the world? We wanted the church to leave the sanctuary, to be deployed, to be what it was always supposed to be in the world. Well, it's come true, but in a way we never expected or wanted. And it's disorienting, it's hard work, it's frightening, and we feel like Philip, who said, Lord, we don't know where we're going. How can we know the way Nobody's prepared us for anything like this. The gospel story for this week is one that we often associate with funerals, read to assure family and friends that Jesus is taking care of their loved ones into eternity, and to encourage all of us how to keep on living when our lives will never be the same again. When Jesus spoke these words, they had a similar purpose, of course. They had just shared the last supper they would ever eat together. Jesus had washed their feet and commanded them to love one another as he loved them. He told them he would only be with them a little while longer. The glorious years of teaching, healing touch, shared meals, and singing psalms would soon be a memory. In a short time, Peter the rock would deny him. By afternoon of the next day, Jesus would be crucified and life would never be the same again. Knowing they'd have a hard time handling all that he told them, Jesus tried to prepare them for what was ahead. Do not let your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Well, how does that sound to you today? I remember how when I was a kid, if a grown-up told me not to be afraid, I was pretty sure there was something I should be afraid of. Yet Jesus wants them to believe that even though he's not going to be beside them, his relationship with them will not change. He will need them to keep on living the mission he had lived. About 2,000 years later then, that's exactly what you are doing. You and congregations miss each other and just want to be together again. Your pastors are working harder than ever. Many have been learning new technology. Everyone is rethinking every movement in worship, enlisting lay leaders to call people who are homebound, and reinventing faith formation online when students are doing everything for school online. Many have become 24-7 homeschoolers, in addition to serving as your pastor, and the weight of all this is heavy. All of you have found life drastically transformed, setting up your own home office, teaching your kids, missing your grandkids and parents, working on the front lines, 
sewing masks, getting out to do spring planting, and worrying about what's going to happen with your retirement or with meat processing and the whole economy. And we cry with Philip, Lord, we don't have a clue how to navigate through a pandemic. How can we know the way? I know that all of us have experienced crises in life, things for which we were never prepared. A sudden illness, the death of a spouse or parent or child, the loss of a job, the ending of a marriage, the end of a friendship. And again and again in my ministry, I have heard people remark, there's no way I could have gotten through this experience without God, without my faith, without my church. I'm reminded of one of the amazing people I've had the pleasure of knowing in my ministry, Thorpe Running, whose funeral I presided 10 years ago, April 30th. Thorpe was the son of Concordia College artist Cyrus Running. He was a professor of Spanish and Spanish, Spanish literature and a recognized scholar of Latin American poetry. Thorpe studied the writings of Jorge Luis Borges, an Argentinian author who said, nothing is built on stone, everything on sand, but our duty is to build as if the sand were stone. Thorpe was also an amazing triathlete, riding his bike to teach at St. John's University daily. But in 1999, while on a training ride, Thorpe steered away from a patch of fresh gravel, loose rocks on the road, headed for the grass, and in an instant, his life was changed forever. I will never forget getting the call from his daughters, going to ER, and hearing that Thorpe would be a quadriplegic. I couldn't believe it. Not this triathlete, not because of some stupid gravel. But Thorpe's life was built on a firm foundation. And during the next 11 years, his heart didn't turn to stone. He didn't sit around in self-pity, nor wonder why this happened or about the way forward. Instead, he simply became ever more compassionate, more perceptive, more courageous, more gracious to everyone. Supported by his wife, Cheryl, and surrounded by a circle of caregivers, Thorpe utilized his wheelchair and computer technology to teach his students, greet his friends, join in worship, and provide an unmovable presence to everyone who knew him. He knew who he was and whose he was. He built his life as if the sand were stone. Since mid-March, our country has been forced to decide how we are going to live, how are we going to move forward when it feels like we're on shifting sand and we don't know the way to go. We don't choose the tragedies that come into our lives. Bad things happen because we are not perfect. Our bodies aren't invincible to disease or injury. We hurt one another intentionally or unintentionally. And sometimes people suffer because of the brokenness of whole communities or nations. This disease right now makes it feel like everything around us is shifting. And yet, in the midst of all the uncertainty, some things become stronger. Being in this together, being at home together, has forced us to slow down, pay attention, sort out what's important, and what we need to let go. After the 9-11 attacks, theologian Phyllis Tickle said that she saw the people of New York burned through to compassion I think today each of us can name stories of generosity and compassion and loving actions that ordinary people are taking on just because they care. Our isolation is moving us to reach out to people we've lost touch with and to visibly express our gratitude to the people sacrificing themselves to care for others, 
provide our food, protect our communities, keep things running. People have expressed new spiritual hungering and many are joining in worship services and opportunities for prayer for the first time. You are experiencing how to be the church out of the building, in your homes, connected through screens and phones and Facebook and mail, by whatever means have been available in the place where you live. You're connected to the other 234 congregations of our synod across the geographical area of southwestern Minnesota. You've known your need for God to be a rock and a refuge and a strong fortress. You have experienced what it means to be living stones built not into a sanctuary, but into a spiritual house. There's a story in the Old Testament that tells how King David offered to build God a beautiful house of cedar so God would have some place to live. And God replied, you know, David, I've been doing very well leading you and living with your people wherever you went. Did I ever once complain and ask you to build me a house to live in? I claimed you and blessed you. I've been with you through everything. So here's the deal. I will build you a house. That is, I'll make you a house of people. Down the road, okay, there will be a house built for me. But more important than that is that you, my people, are my house, the place where I most want to dwell. Later in the New Testament, the earliest followers of Jesus saw themselves as built together into God's temple. Unlike their neighbors who worship their various gods only in temple buildings, Peter thinks of the early Christians themselves as living stones, worshiping together in small house church gatherings and communities of Jesus followers. These living stones gathered together to sing psalms of praise, to pray, and to hear the words of Jesus crucified and risen. We tend to think of church as a building, as in we're going to church or we can't be in church now. But in the New Testament, the word church appears once, only in Matthew, and it refers to the people called out to a meeting, called to assemble. Today, the church is still being called out, still assembling, much like people did in those house churches 2,000 years ago. Not in a sanctuary, but with the safety and technology available to us today. And you are indeed doing that in a variety of ways, as a gallery of faces appear in a Zoom call, as greetings and emoji hearts rise in a chat, as friends call each other on the phone to check on how they're doing or share a Bible study together over the phone, as people look through their contacts list and pray for the people they see there or send them a note. As people of all ages sew masks to keep people safe or share clothing for those who are homeless. Loving your neighbors as you bring healing and help and hope in so many ways. Jesus Christ continues to build you as the household of God transformed for today. Come to Christ, that living stone rejected by people, but in God's sight chosen and precious. And like living stones, be yourselves built into a spiritual house. Or as St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, So then you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are built into it for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. You know, as much as you and I feel alone today, as much as the isolation and loneliness threaten to overwhelm you, you are not alone. You are gathered into the embrace of Jesus Christ, the stone that was rejected, who knew every betrayal and denial and pain that you and I will ever know and was finally put to death on a cross. Sometimes we wonder where God has gone, 
But if you want to see the very heart of God, then look to Jesus on the cross and see the length to which self-sacrificing love will go for you and for me and for the sake of this whole world. And having seen him there, then see him again on Easter morning, because it's there that you will see the power of God that rolled away that stone so that life and love and light might be turned loose on earth forever. Dear friends, these are troubling days. We're afraid. We don't know much about the way to go. Life seems like shifting sand. But as the prophet said so long ago, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the quarry from which you were dug. You stand on Jesus Christ, the cornerstone and foundation. You are living stones connected wherever your room may be, together even though apart, because you are built into the household of God. Whether you are part of a church congregation or a new friend dropping in today, you are precious in God's sight. In Jesus Christ, God is with you and will never let you go. Amen. Together as living stones in our baptism and together with the whole Church of God, we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, created on heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. 
He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 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 Once again, thank you for joining us for worship today. And thank you especially for the support you continue to give to your local congregation. We hear stories from all over the Synod, all over the church, really, of people stepping up in generosity in these times. Your offerings and support for the ministry of your congregation and of the community organizations it supports has never been more important. This is the time in the service where the offering is normally taken. You will know how best to send that contribution to your congregation. while gathered together in the spirit of Christ, we ask God to bestow peace upon a needy world using words from today's psalm. Incline your ear to us, make haste to help us. Faithful God, we pray for the church around the world. Enter into our countless separate houses with your gift of peace. Guard the health of our bishops, especially Elizabeth and John, and of all pastors, deacons, teachers, and musicians. Protect our partners in the Southeastern Diocese of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Southern Africa. As Christians around the globe are united in suffering through the coronavirus, so unite us also in the hope of life in the risen Christ. Incline your ear to us, make haste to help us. Creating God, we pray for the earth that you have given into our care. As human society is quieted by sickness, give your plants and animals, lands and seas, a time to renew and replenish themselves. Nurture the fields, bless the farmers and ranchers, and all who grow food for your people. Incline your ear to us, make haste to help us. Righteous God, we pray for the nations. Give peace to your troubled world. Bless the efforts of the United Nations and the World Health Organization. Strengthen democracies. Bring an end to violence between nations, across borders, within countries, and inside homes. Bless our country with integrity in government, attention to the needy, persistence in facing the pandemic, and wisdom in proceeding into an unknown future. Gracious God, we pray for children and youth. Shelter them from all sickness. Keep homebound children safe from hunger and abuse. Nurture teenagers with a vision of life beyond this pandemic. Give them assurance as they are separated physically from friends and mentors. Give to all children and youth forbearance beyond their years. Incline your ear to us, make haste to help us. Compassionate God, we pray pray for all in any need. Comfort the bereaved. Accompany the sick, especially the multitude who have contracted the coronavirus, and those we remember in our hearts. Visit the homes of all who are isolated, and hold the lonely and fearful in your arms. Grant your peace to the millions of unemployed. Give them food for today and hope for tomorrow. Help us find a home for refugees. Strengthen medical care workers in their endless and sometimes fruitless tasks of attending to the pandemic patients. 
provide, <clears throat> provide needed medical supplies for hospitals. Incline your ear to us. Make haste to help us. Loving God, we pray for ourselves. Renew our spirits with the living hope of Christ's resurrection and hear also the private petitions of all our hearts. Incline your ear to us. Make haste to help us. Eternal God, we praise you for the lives of all who have died in the faith, especially those we name here before you. Sustained by the promise of healing and resurrection, free us from the fear of death, and bring us at our end with all the saints into the joy of your presence. With bold confidence in your peace, which passes human understanding, we offer these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, now and forever. Amen. Gathered in one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed by thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me on, let me, let me stand, for I am tired, I am weak, and Lord, you know, don't you know I'm worn through the storms and through the night? Lead me on to your precious light. Take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. When my way draws, it draws near. Precious Lord, I, I want you to, I need you to linger near. When my light is all, almost gone, hear my cry, hear my call, hold my hand, take my hand, Lord, lest I fall, take my hand, precious Lord, and lead me home. Now comes the time for the blessing. This is a time when we raise hands, not simply the pastor on the assembly, but on each other. So I would invite you, if you're with someone else in the room with their permission, you do a gesture of blessing, the sign of the cross on their forehead or hands on the shoulder or head. You will know what's right for you. And if you are by yourself, I invite you to think about those people in your life, in the world, that you would ask God's blessing on and to raise your hands in a gesture of blessing. Now may the Lord God who builds us up from ejected stones, who unites us together in the body of Christ, strengthen you and keep you this day 
and to the end of the age. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be to God.